going to start at Psalm 119, a very familiar passage. And uh, I, we're going to be talking about quite a few passages today. And uh, I've been doing this thing called, uh, basically, what I'm calling it is a extended book review of this book by uh, Ted and Margie Tripp. I mean, Ted and Margie Tripp, Instructing a Child's Heart. And uh, I found it uh, quite, I've enjoyed reading it. Now, a lot of the things that are in it are things that I've heard, I don't know, hundreds of times in my life. And today is definitely one of those sessions, the parts that I'm going to be talking about. And so last time I talked about, this is, comes from the second chapter, the five goals for formative instruction. So by formative instruction, they mean those things that help build Christian character uh, and Christian faith in young people. Now, the book is about training children, raising children. But the reason that I'm so interested in it is as I read it and as I listen to uh, Ted Tripp talk about it earlier, the... uh, I thought, this sounds like something every Christian needs. Every Christian, it's not that you not necessarily have children in your home anymore, uh, and only a few of you do amongst us, but every Christian has an influence on other Christians, but even more so, they're just talking about a Christian way of life. And so I think it's important for us to think about these things. So they had five goals for formative instruction, and I spent all our time last time talking on this one. Remember, Scripture is our personal history. So, the whole story of the Bible, it's our story. It's, it's, and it's something that we need to think about and develop our thinking around the record and story of what the Bible says. So the others are develop godly habits, apply scripture to life, model spiritual vitality, grow into a mature relationship with your children. Now, no, noting the fact that we have, we're not just talking about instructing children, Okay. Now, today what I'd like to do then is briefly discuss these four goals. I'm going to start with that famous text in Psalm 119, 9 through 11. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. With all my heart I have sought you. Do not let me wander from your commandments. Your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. And so I'm going to give you a title. Applying the Scripture to Life. That's what we're going to be talking about. Now, um, we, as I said, we're, the book has the idea of instructing children. And my thesis is that this book is for everyone. Uh, you can't instruct children without mastering the subject yourself. Well, you can't instruct anyone. If you're teaching something, I was just talking to Boyu, he's teaching math at University of Waterloo this year. He's not going to go anywhere. He's going to record lectures in fourth year math, college math. And it'll be like talking Greek. If you were to watch his videos, you'd think, what in the world is that guy talking about? Okay, <clears throat> but anyway, that's what, but you see, the thing is, he knows what he's talking about. We think, we think he does. <laughs> All right. But that's the point. That's the point the teacher is supposed to know. So if you're going to have an influence on other people, you need to have this. You need to know what the Christian life is. And the thing is, everyone should live to be a positive biblical influence on someone. And it may not be children, but it may be that you, the Lord will bring somebody into your life who doesn't know the Lord and, or is new. They've just come to know the Lord and they have lots of questions. Well, and it's not just answering Bible questions. It's not just Bible content. I think we're pretty good at picking up Bible content. But what I'm after here is picking up Christian life, how we should live. All right, so here we go. Develop godly habits. Habits create life patterns. There's a verse in the Proverbs, famous verse about training children, training up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, I've heard countless sermons on this particular verse as well. Uh, Now, we have to remember, it's a proverb. A proverb is not, 
uh, it is not an absolute truth. Even the Proverbs of the Old Testament are not absolute truths. All right, so it is a principle. It's a general truism. All right, there, there, we can think of exceptions to the rule. Children who do not follow the life in which they were raised. If you came to Christ uh, as an adult, in some ways you are not following the way you were trained. Okay, but there, but that's not the point of this proverb. It's not a proverb that is meant to teach you. Okay, if you just do the right, you teach the kid the right things. Boom, they're guaranteed to be Christians and live for the Lord the rest of their life. It's not what it's saying. All right, but what it is saying is that you make choices today that affect your tomorrow, and you can make habits today that will affect your pattern of life. So. As a person develops godly habits, a person is trained in a way of thinking, uh, it will affect the way they live the rest of their lives. Now, habits can be good or they can be bad. And they are formed the same way. The individual is either has for him, he either has his choices limited for him, or he limits his own choices. And he repeats them over and over and over again. And he develops his habits. Now what do I mean by delimiting choices? It's a choice that puts a limit on behavior. Or a choice that counteracts random or impulsive behavior. So one, I try to think of an illustration that would be somewhat innocuous. And, and, and I know that you're not supposed to use personal illustrations, but... So I have one, it's a personal illustration. And you know how when I eat, most of you know that I use this little app on my phone, my fitness pal, and I regulate what I eat. And I just tried something new with it today. Uh, you know those vanilla wafer cookies that somebody brings, oh, they're so good. They're deadly though, there's so many calories. However, I forgot what they were called. I couldn't, okay, what do I call those? To call it up in the database. But the, the app has a feature now. You turn on the camera, you point it at the thing, and it says, vanilla wafers, so many calories. That's the one. <laughs> cool, isn't that cool? That is really awesome. I had three of them today. Okay, so, however, with this app, I have made a choice to limit my eating based on calorie counting. And that counteracted my previous random habits. That limited my self-destructive behavior. My dad used to say, you're digging your grave with your teeth. <laughs> I said, what a way to go. <laughs> what a smart aleck. Okay, now I have somewhat succeeded, although maintaining is harder than losing. Okay, it's <laughs> like I got way down and then it's sort of inching, inching, even though I'm not eating a lot inching back up, as you know, and that's, we're struggling. I'm trying to stop. Anyhow, that's neither here nor there, but that's the point, delimiting choices. So you're, 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 you put yourself under a, under a discipline, okay? Or, if you are the father or mother, you may discipline your child. You restrict what they can choose, uh, how they can behave, what they can do, where they can go, when they go to bed, not necessarily when they go to sleep, but at least certain things. Right, But also spiritual choices and spiritual habits involve a similar process. You counteract the desire of the heart to satisfy lusts and serve self. That is the natural heart we're all born with. We all tend to, if we were left to ourselves, you know, if you had nobody restricting you, think about what you would be like. Like if you were a kid living on the street somehow survived, and had nobody to tell you what to do. What kind of person would you be? How successful would you be? It would be very hard. Occasionally there's somebody who comes out of a very tough background like that, and through self-discipline and whatever, they somehow form some character and get out of that. But most people don't. Right? So... <clears throat> In order to develop godly habits, you impose consistent behavior to follow the spiritual pattern and overcome the
the fleshly pattern. We do have an example in the scriptures from Timothy's life. Paul says to Timothy, I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am sure that it is in you as well. And then later in the epistle he says, You, however, continue in the things you have learned and to become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And so Timothy developed godly habits in his life. And this is how Scripture functions. Paul also says just after that, all Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. And so he, the Scripture limits us, limits our behavior, develops uh, godly habits. We study the Scriptures. We search the Scriptures for how to live. It does, it does limit us, tell us not to just indulge our wants and the things that we desire. And so we, we develop character, Christ, spiritual Christian character. And that verse again from Proverbs, or Psalm 119, how can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. With all my heart I have sought you. Do not let me wander from your commandments. Your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. So the more you develop spiritual habits, the more you will enjoy the freedom that we find in walking by the Spirit. Oftentimes oftentimes people think about uh, spiritual disciplines as uh, the the fruit of narrow-minded Christians trying to control me. There's people who think that way. That somehow, if we limit ourselves, and if we say no to certain things, that we are... We're just not enjoying the liberty of the Holy Spirit. But I want to testify that the more that we walk with God and we say no to the flesh and yes to God, I'm not talking about salvation here, just Christian living. In the Spirit, if we walk in the Spirit and just say, I want to please God, and and we think about the things that we're doing, does that really please God? Do you know that you find real joy in pursuing things that you are satisfied by the Scriptures and your, the Holy Spirit within you that indeed really do please God. And the more that you develop this kind of lifestyle and these kind of habits, the more, the, the more uh, spiritual affirmation uh, within, coming from the Holy Spirit, you will have. And then apply Scripture to life. It's sort of redundant with my title, but For this one, I'm going to choose an illustration from the life of David. So here we go. This is David. He's uh, 1 Samuel 17. He's talking to Saul. David said to Saul, Your servant was tending his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went out after him and attacked him and rescued it from his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I seized him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, since he has taunted the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. Now later on in that chapter, David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. This day the Lord will deliver you up into my hands, and I will strike you down and remove your head from you. And I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Now that's, of course, quite a dramatic statement. And David isn't using scripture directly here. Okay, he's, he's not refuting or making his point with Scripture. But consider where his thoughts come from. Where does he know about the, the living God? Where does he know about the Lord who delivers? Where does he know about the Lord of hosts? Well, he knows about it, I think, from the law of God. Now, as far as a written Bible at this point in time... Here's what David has. He has maybe Job. He has the first five books of the Old Testament. 
Uh, he might have a couple of psalms he has written, whether he knows their scripture or not, I don't know. But he, that's all he has. And some people have said that the psalms are meditations on God's law. You read the psalms. You think about where David is getting his thinking. When David says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Where is he getting that? Well, he's getting that from two sources, one from the law and one from his experience with walking with God. And so his thoughts are deep meditations on the law. And so what I'm suggesting here is that the life of David, even in this that doesn't show that he's directly tying to Scripture, it reflects a life that has meditated on what he has learned from Scripture. Even though he's not an old man at this point, he does have an understanding of who God is and his place before him. And so I think we see this kind of meditation reflected here. The Philistine opposed God and God's people and blasphemed God. And the Lord called his people to oppose him. David's confidence is in God, not in his own strength. And so David's words apply scriptural principles to his life situation. And so again, as we study the scripture, I think these things as we face all kinds of experiences in our life, and even as we this last year had such a momentous uh, occasion, the scriptural principles have guided us and helped be an anchor for us, even in our distress. All right, the third one is model spiritual vitality. I won't spend a lot of time here. Uh, there is a kind of lip service to God that doesn't really live by God's word. First, 2 Timothy 3 talks about those who are holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. They, talk, they have the God talk, but they don't have the depth of vital spiritual life. Uh, the way to teach others to trust God in prayer, for example, is to model trusting God in prayer. Uh, we should be praying for things. I think we often are praying generically or things that we know, okay, God could answer, but you know, we've known the way life goes. For example, we pray for somebody who's sick. Okay, he's either going to heal them or they're going to get sicker, right? And we know some who are in the last stages of their life. We know that God isn't going to heal them in the sense that they are going to stand up walking and be in a 20-year-old body and have another 80 years of life to live. We know that is true. So as we pray for them, we should be praying more for their circumstances as they are, right? Uh, I think about my mother. She's 97. You know, the Lord isn't going to turn her into a 30-year-old woman when I pay, pray for her relief. But I can pray for specific things about things that are happening for her right now. I can recall when we had our little kids growing up, there were times when we tried to... Uh, certain things that we needed to have in our home, and we would ask God to provide for those things. And it was interesting how that over time, as we were praying for some things, some money would come in, we could set it aside, and that could become a part of that answer. And there have been occasions where God has almost miraculously for us, in a sense, answered a prayer. We have to live that. You need to live what you believe have not only the outward look of Christianity, but the inward life. And then the fourth one, grow into a mature relationship with your children, which is kind of interesting the way this is stated. And again, remember that this context of the book is instructing children. What if you don't have children? Well, you know, still, grow into a mature spiritual relationship with someone. Okay. Now, uh, the pattern of Scripture. We have, for example, Joshua. Joshua made a choice for his household. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's Joshua's choice. The psalmist says, Walk about Zion and go around her. Count her towers. Consider her ramparts. Go through her palaces that you may tell it to the next generation. For such is God, our God forever and ever. He will guide us until death. So the psalmist is saying, I've made a choice. 
that I'm going to meditate on the things of God and I'm going to recount them and rehearse them to the next generation, to my children. Then another psalmist says, uh, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us, we will not conceal from them from their children, but, will, uh, but tell to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wondrous works that he has done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers, that they should teach them to their children, that that generation to come might know, even the children yet to be born, that they may arise and tell them to their children, and that they should put their confidence in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. And so this psalmist is also committed. He has heard and he will tell what uh, has happened in his life. So scriptural living... Demand, uh, develops in company with others. We need to make an effort to orient our lives around the Bible. This is part of the theme of what we've been talking about through all of these points. Uh, preachers used to talk about family worship or family altar, having a time in home. Now, it's, it isn't always easy to develop that kind of uh, uh, practice in your home. But the idea is to take time to read the Bible on a regular basis uh, in your home, with your family, or if not with your family, with someone else. Take time to pray with one another. Uh, sometimes uh, things might be missed because of circumstances. Uh, I'm not sure what happened this morning. I did not hear the alarm this morning. And I woke up with a start at 8 a.m. Uh, Uh-oh, <laughs> i got to get ready. My wife was already downstairs and was busy reading her Bible, but I knew that we weren't going to have time for, uh, for, for me to sit down with her and read this morning. But we generally try to, on the mornings, read a chapter right now of First or Second Peter. And so take time. And the more you make this a habit, the deeper your walk and the w- person you're reading with, the deeper their walk will grow. And you might be alone in your family. So, uh, you know, you don't, you don't have a family at home, little ones at home to read with. But find a friend. Meet once a week or as often. Set up a weekly meeting that is flexible, but it, as often as possible to read the Bible, read a chapter together, to pray, uh, to develop together a spiritual Christian life. Grow in your communion with the Lord, with your friends. This is, this is what the body life of the church is all about. I talk about this quite a bit. This is what, and that's what we try to do here, but I'm talking about something outside of our regular activities. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's something that we can do. As we gather together and hear the Word of God and listen to sermons and uh, sing the songs together, that's all part of developing and modeling a spiritual, vital life. But... You can do this on an individual basis with somebody else, and it will be a help to them. Now, some, you're going to have to find somebody who's interested, but it will be a help to them. It will be a help to you, help you develop godly habits, help you apply Scripture to your life, help you to model spiritual vitality, and help you to grow into a mature spiritual relationship with someone else. All right, so the instructions of this message aren't very profound. I've heard preachers talk about things like this all my life. I really have. I've managed to practice some of it. Uh, How much better our lives would be if we could put these things in practice more and more each day. I hope that just these remarks, it's not really a formal message, but uh, just these remarks on these points might be something that will be a help to you. That, that we're trying to inculcate in our people the idea of a, spirit, or a Bible-saturated life so that we think Bible, we apply Bible, we live Bible. That's what we want to do so that we can be successful Christians in our community. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer as we close. Father, we thank you so much for the Word of God, for all that it has done for us and it is teaching us. We pray, Lord, that as we uh, think about these thoughts today, that we would develop spiritual disciplines in our lives so that we could become even more successful servants for you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.